Okay, it's it's starting up. Um, and we are live. Let me just run the intro one more time. Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. Friends, thank you so much for being here. We had a couple tr- stream issues after a short break of not doing any podcasts. We are finally back and live streaming. We've changed the format, and yes, it's and it's just me behind the wheel. So if you, you feel some bumps, that's that's why. It's just our first show back. But sit back, relax, grab a drink, enjoy this conversation with my guest. My guest this week is Massimo Pigliucci. He is a scientist, skeptic, and philosopher who in recent years has written a number of books on Stoicism. He earned a PhD in philosophy from the University of Tennessee and is the KD Irani Professor of Philosophy at the City of College of New York. He also has a background in biology with a PhD in evolutionary biology from the University of Connecticut. Massimo, what a list of credentials you have, my good sir. Welcome to HXP. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Let's hope that we're going to stay. Um, <laughs> yes, indeed. And we were we were talking a little bit about the, about the show, and I, I mean, we were running into some issues. It's a perfect way to bring in what Stoic philosophy is and what Stoicism encompasses. Can you tell us a little bit about so- what is Stoicism? Well, we, uh, the two of us just experienced uh, a, a classic situation where I think Stoicism helps. One of the fundamental concepts of Stoicism is uh, something called the dichotomy of control, which essentially tells you or reminds you of the fact that some things are under your control and other things are not under your control. And that you, as, as a consequence, it's logical to focus on the things that are under your control and then take the rest as it comes. If you can influence it for the better, good, and if not, that's that's okay. You have to make peace of it uh, with it. So, for instance, you know, we just had, as you know, some technical difficulties first with my setup, then then, then with yours. Hmm. Well, there are things we can do about it, of course. You know, right? So, I we I try to fix the, the, the bit on my part. Eventually, we succeeded. You try to fix um, the bit on your part, and eventually, you did succeed. But while you were working on your part, there was absolutely nothing I could do other than just wait. Now. Some people might get upset or nervous or, you know, start feeling around or something. In my case, it's like, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If it's not going to happen, it's going to happen another day. For sure. Uh, it's not a tragedy, right? It's not the end of the world. Uh, if we can make this happen today, great. If not, um, we will find something else. So this is a classic example of, you know, many, many times in life, you know, almost on a daily basis, we run across things that, you know, small or, or big that are going to uh, frustrate us or that make us angry or that make us, you know, uh, disappointed and things like that. But if you train yourself to always, everything you do, think in terms of the dichotomy of control, you always ask yourself, the first question you ask yourself is, well, is this under my control? If the answer is yes, then, okay, well, what can I do about it? Mm-hmm. And if the answer is no, it's like, well, then sit back and relax because there's nothing else you can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there, and this is why I think I connect with what Stoicism teaches so much is because, you know, most most of the things external to us are completely out of our control. Like we're not we're not able to manage the emotions and feelings of other people. We can't imagine. I mean, and life life t- tends to throw, you know, curveballs at us. And we just we sort of just have to adapt to those things. And I think this is where the the strongest part of stoicism is is it it kind of teaches you how to do that that's right and the thing that, that's important however to keep in mind is this isn't a question of uh, you know it's not a quietist philosophy it's not a oh well there's nothing i can do about it therefore i'm just not going to do anything 
uh, it, it, if it were just that, then it would be a you know, kind of losing proposition because it, that means that you would just disengage from everything that uh, you're not guaranteed to succeed. To succeed. The, the approach is different. The approach is to try to keep in mind where your locus of action is. Where is it that you're going to be more effective uh, in, a, in, in tackling a particular problem and focus your energy there. The other side of that, of that approach of the dichotomy of control is that what you cannot control you should develop an attitude of equanimity, of sort of accepting with with serenity what's going what's going to happen. Uh, this is actually very similar to uh, concepts that are found in other traditions, including in eighth uh, century uh, Buddhism and in medieval Judaism, and also in Christianity. Um, some of your listeners may have, have heard of the Serenity Prayer, which is a standard prayer. It's a 20th century Christian prayer that is used at the beginning of AA meetings or, or similar 12-step uh, organizations. And of course, I never remember on the spot how exactly the prayer goes, but essentially it is asking God to allow you to make the distinction between what is under your control and what is not under your control, having the patience and fortitude to uh, withstand, you know, to, to accept what is not under your control and the courage to actually change what it is under your control. Mm -hmm. It's essentially the same, uh, the same concept as in Stoicism, and it's not by chance, because as it turns out, the most famous rendition of this dichotomy of control is found at the beginning of Epictetus and Chiridion. The Enchiridion is kind of a short manual for how to live your life which was written in, uh, in the second century. And uh, after the, the end of the Roman Empire, when Christianity basically took over throughout the Middle Ages, the Enchiridion was actually used by Christian monks as a training manual. Uh, the only difference with the original is that every time that, the, that Epictetus was talking about Socrates as an example, uh, the good Christian monks uh, replaced the word Socrates with the word Jesus. But other than that, it's the same thing. So it's no surprise that we actually find the same concept in a number of different traditions, including the Christian one, which has been highly influenced by by Stoicism. Mm -hmm. When I, you know, when I think of someone who is Stoic in mainstream culture, I think of Spock from Star Trek. <laughs> That's yes. who I think of when I think of someone who is Stoic. Is it so? Is it? I mean, just to clarify this, is it? Is, is it? suppressing your emotions that's not what stoicism is is it no it isn't and and in fact the, the, i'm glad you brought up spock because the typical reaction of most practicing stoics is is to tell you that no it isn't like spock at all it, but it's actually not quite that easy because despite the fact that spock is supposed to be suppressing emotions if you actually pay attention to the original series and to, and to the various movies based on the original series you will see this that spock does have emotions they have positive, they're positive emotions, however. He loves his friends, for instance. Okay, love is an emotion. He says several, time, uh, several times that he's a, a close friend of uh, Captain Kirk and, and Dr. McCoy. Uh, he clearly cares about knowledge and science. He also very clearly cares about justice and ethics, right? And in one of the movies, he actually sacrifices himself saying that, you know, the, the, the benefit of the, of the many ought to... Um, outweigh the benefits of the one. Well, all of those are actually positive emotions. So despite Spock's own protestations that he doesn't have emotions and then he wants to control emotions, that's not quite what he's doing. What he's doing is to controlling the negative emotions, the disruptive emotions, things like anger, hatred, fear. Those are the emotions that are really not good for you. Mm -hmm. And that pretty much is the stoic attitude. Stoicism is not about suppressing emotions, but rather in a sense to sort of reorient our emotional spectrum away from negative, disruptive emotions such as hatred, fear, um, and, and um, um, you know, and, uh, and anger especially, and toward the, uh, the express cultivation of positive emotions such as love, joy, sense of justice, and so on and so forth. So, so in a sense, there is something true about the stereotype Except that, of course, like every stereotype, it only gets things half right or a quarter right, not, not the full sure. picture. The other part of the stereotype that is typical uh, when, when people use the word stoic in the sort of the common uh, meaning as opposed to the philosophical one is that uh, stoics are often envisioned as going through life with a stiff upper lip. <laughs> well, and so therefore being, you know, particularly, not particularly fun to hang around with. Mm -hmm. um, that's also not true, of course. But, you know, Stoics do all sorts of things that everybody else does. In fact, Seneca 
uh, one of the major Roman Stoics explicitly says that sometimes you just have to let it go, go dancing, go out for a walk, enjoying wine, even to intoxication. That doesn't sound like somebody who's not having fun. Right. But the right, the, the right part, the correct part of the stereotype is that, in fact, endurance is, in fact, a Stoic value. Okay. Uh, the notion is that we should endure what we cannot control. We're, we're going back now to the dichotomy of control uh, that we started with. Uh, sure, if something is not under your control, if you cannot do anything about it, then you only have two choices, really. Either you endure it and, and try to sort of uh, uh, get over the, this particular hump in your life, or you can start throwing tantrums and get upset. and, and you know, just makes and it worse. Think that, which simply makes it worse. Yeah. That's right. Uh, it doesn't actually improve things. In fact, it makes it worse, makes you feel worse. And probably uh, because that kind of strong emotional reaction clouds your judgment, it actually makes things also worse in a, in a practical sense. Yeah. I mean, if I think of any time where I've been in a situation where things are out of my control, whenever I make the choice to sort of react or bite into those emotions, it just makes it tremendously worse. I mean, yeah. whether it's you know, a fight with a friend or something that's going on. Like I was traveling last week and it was, it was like mini disaster after mini, you know, like just putting out right. these various fires. And if you find yourself in this state of panic, when that's happening, it, it merely makes the situation that much, that much worse. So and there's so much, there's so much to be said about the power of stoicism and right. having that, as you said, this uh, sort of meter on your, your emotions and being aware of them and, and, honing out you know the the negative versus the positive and being selective about that yeah part of the problem of course is well how do you do that because you know the theory is it's pretty clear i mean you, you can i can explain stoic theory in, in the basics of stoic theory in a few minutes and if you really want to get into the details we, we need a few hours but mm -hmm. no more than that so it's not that difficult it's the practice of course that is that is difficult but but let me tell you a couple of things about this so first of all it's not surprising that the practice is, is difficult I mean, imagine uh, a, a completely different kind of situations, which, however, the Stoics did use as, a, as an analogy often to explain their philosophy. They said, you know, imagine you go to the gym and, uh, you know, you, you, you call up a, somebody, you know, a trainer, and the trainer explains to you the theory of, you know, how to do your exercises. It's not rocket science. You, you can listen to the trainer and understand what he's saying, and in a few minutes you get the, the, the gist of it. But that doesn't mean that you in a few minutes you're going to grow muscles and and and, sure. and eliminate fat right so that's going to take hours and hours and days and days and then months and months and eventually years and years of practice it's the same with a philosophy of life mm -hmm. whether it's stoicism or christianity or buddhism or anything else the theory is not that difficult the practice because it takes you know time it, you get better only only with time now there are however some some basic techniques some basic ways of doing this. And one of them is being proposed by um, a modern Stoic, actually, Bill Irvine, uh, who is uh, publishing, about to publish, actually, a new book called The Stoic Challenge, uh, which is going to come up in, come out in, uh, in September. And uh, Bill says, OK, so every time you go through a situation like the one you were talking about at the airport, you know, things that, or you're on a vacation, things don't go well and everything. Well, try this little mental trick. Hmm. Imagine that. Uh, uh, you think, okay, so this this is the Stoics God are sending me a test. They're testing me. <laughs> they want to know how I'm doing under these conditions. And so for the duration of the test, which is, of course, the duration of whatever problem uh, you have to actually tackle, you're going to keep mental scores with yourself. Well, so how am I doing? Am I reacting with anger? Am I actually reacting reasonably? Am I making progress? Am I getting frustrated? And so on. And then at the end, when the challenge is over, you sort of, uh, sit down, maybe, maybe even write it down and say, so how did I do on this? Thing? Um, and the trick is, of course, it's a mind trick, right? Hmm. But mind tricks are crucial. I mean, this, this is how we actually live our lives. I mean, our lives, our mental lives and our actual real lives are a, the result of a number of mind tricks. Mm -hmm. The way you think about things completely changes the way you actually experience them and, and the way you react to them. So every time you have a challenge, every time it's, it's, that something happens that doesn't go your way, just say, stop for a second and, and say to yourself, either, you know, loudly, if nobody's around to listen to you, or, uh, you know, mentally, it's like, ah, here's a, here comes a challenge from the Stoic gods. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to believe in Stoic gods, obviously. Bill Irvine doesn't believe in Stoic gods, and neither do I. Um, it's just a mental device and say, okay, 
here's a challenge. Let me see how I, how I do. Let me keep ta- tabs on how I'm doing. And then I'm going to write a report to myself. That's hmm. an important part. So writing down things, uh, essentially doing what uh, Stoics refer to as a philosophical diary. It's important because for one thing, it allows you after the fact to analyze more calmly your own reactions and think about what went, what went, what went right and what went wrong. But also, since you know you're going to do that, uh, you're going to actually self-examine basically in writing. Then uh, Seneca suggests uh, you're going to be more careful about what you do because you're not going to lie to yourself. If you, have, if you know that you're going to have to write things down, you're not going to pretend that you did something different. You know what you did. <laughs> And you're going to write it down. So you're going to hold yourself accountable, essentially, for your actions, both in the good and in the bad. Hmm. Okay. So, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, and I'm, I'm doing my best. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, first of all, you, you consider yourself a skeptic. I mean, you, you've listed yourself as a skeptic. Does that mean, does that, mean that you have, I mean, do this more, more ob- objectively, I would say, do this, did the Stoics have a belief in God? Well, in a sense, yes, but it needs to be really seriously qualified. So the, the Stoics were, from a modern perspective, what we would call pantheists. Mm-hmm. That is, they believed that God is imminent in the, in the universe. In fact, they believed that God is the universe. Uh, God, for the Stoics, is made of matter. It's physical. And it is exactly the same thing as the universe. I mean, the, they are pretty... pretty um, explicit about this. Uh, if you check uh, Diogenes Laertius, for instance, which is one of the commentators on the early Stoics, he says explicitly, the Stoics called God the same as Zeus, the same as nature. Um, hmm. it's, it's, it's the same, same thing. So in a sense, yes, they did believe in God, but it's a, it's a God that it's actually essentially embedded in the laws of the universe. Now, one difference in, in the way in which we moderns might think of the universe and the way the Stoics thought is that the Stoics, just like pretty much everybody in antiquity, thought that the universe was a living organism. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the universe was was doing whatever it is that is good for itself. So so everything that happens in the universe is good for the universe. And we are bits and pieces of that universe. So indirectly, in a sense, kind of good for us. But not in the sense that the universe actually cares about us, not that there is a God out there that decides what's going to happen and what's not going to happen. It's just that... The organism, that the, the cosmic organism is doing things. We are bits and pieces of that cosmic organism, and so we just go along to the right. Uh, if you will, I, I've come up with an analogy uh, to sort of explain what the, the, uh, a little bit better maybe what the concept is. So sure. um, I have, uh, like, every, like, like every human being, we have, you know, million, hundreds and millions, actually billions of neurons in our brains, right? Each one of those cells uh, is part of me. And I am the organism, so I do whatever it is that's good for me. So in this case, I'm talking to you, and then later on, I'm going to have dinner. Then I'm going to go for a walk or something like that. Well, my neurons don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, But whatever I do is, in a sense, good for the neurons, meaning that the neurons are part of me. So they, they go along with the right, they do their part. If I did not have neurons, I couldn't be talking to you. Mm-hmm. I couldn't be making decisions. I couldn't do anything. Okay. So the relationship between my neurons and myself is pretty much the relationship that the, the ancient Stoics thought there is between us and the universe, where we are the neurons. We are the cells. Um, so the individual cells can die. The individual cells can, you know, bad things can happen to individual cells. They can become, you know, they, they can die out. They can become, you uh, cancers or whatever it is. But what happens to the individual cells is part of the way in which the organism as a whole reacts. So that's the way the ancient Stoics thought about it. Now, most modern Stoics don't believe that the universe is a living organism because, you know, modern physics tells us that things don't work that way. And so uh, a modern Stoic is more likely to accept uh, what is called Einstein's God sometimes. So Einstein was famously asked, you know, do you believe in God? And, and his reply was, sure, I believe in the laws of nature. Mm-hmm. So God here is conceived as the fact that the universe has a rational structure. If it did not have a rational structure, we couldn't understand it. We, there, there would be no science possible. So the universe does have... Still with me, Massimo? Okay, guys, it looks like we might have hit a little bit of that bump that I warned you guys about earlier. We're going to find out what happened to Massimo's uh, 
microphone. So sorry. <laughs> Massimo, are you back? Okay, we lost we lost Massimo. Um hang tight here, guys. Just gonna bring our producer into Massimo, are you still with me? Yes, I'm with Okay, you. okay. You dropped out for a little bit and, and now you're back. Oh. Okay. Oh. All right. Th so, so the last thing when that I heard, drop out? <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you dropped out uh, around when you were talking about the nature of the universe and our interconnected nature to to na to nature, human connected to nature. That was the last thing that right. I got. So we did. So did you hear the part about the neurons and the brain? Yeah, I think so. Okay. But why don't you pick right. up from there, please? Okay. So the analogy that uh, I was making was that just as for the ancient Stoics, God is the universe and we are bits and pieces of it and we do our part within that universe. So in the same way, let's say my neurons, my individual neurons don't know that I'm a part, that, that they are part of a living organism and I am the living organism. I go around doing what it is that I need to do. Um, and the neurons just both go along for the ride and also make it possible because without my neurons, I wouldn't be able to make decisions. I wouldn't be able sure. to do things, right? So it, the way to look at, at how the ancient Stoics thought about the relationship between themselves and the universe is pretty much like the relationship between my neurons and myself. Um, we are part of this cosmic uh, living organism. Now, modern Stoics don't believe, most modern Stoics, there are exceptions, don't believe that the universe is a living organism because you know we've just followed what, whatever the physicists tell us and the physicists don't think of the universe as a living organism mm -hmm. so in that sense a modern stoic is more likely to believe in what is sometimes referred to as einstein's god einstein was famously asked at one point if he if he believed in god and his answer was sure i believe in the laws of nature mm -hmm. and okay. meaning right sorry sorry meaning meaning that uh, well, I believe that the universe is organized in a logical manner, because if it were not organized in a logical manner, in a rational manner, then we wouldn't understand it. We, there would be no science possible. But where that rational organization comes from, we, we don't know. Physicists haven't given an answer yet. So it's just a fact of life. It's a, it's a raw fact. The universe is organized according to laws and principles, and we act following those laws and principles. So, so you do you think that this uh, accordance to living in connection to nature? I mean, uh, what position that does that put us in? Do you think it 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 puts us in a place to grow as people more if we're connected to nature? I think so, um, but but we need to be clear about what that phrase actually means in the Stoic context. So, one thing that it doesn't mean is that we should go running naked into the forest and hanging trees. That's not what living according to nature means. Although, of course, there's nothing wrong with that if you want to do it. Um, but the, the, the phrase itself just means that we should be taking seriously both the nature of the universe and the nature of humanity, our human beings. Okay. Still there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, good. Because Listening. now I'm getting paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. No, I got a little silent because I thought you were going to keep yeah, going. Yeah, all right. So, okay, yeah, I'm going to keep going. So, okay. So what that means is, is two things. The nature of the universe and the nature of humanity. The nature of the universe means that we better live our lives following, you know, understanding exactly how the laws, the, the laws of physics work. If you try to do something that goes against the laws of physics, you're going to get yourself into trouble. Now, you might say, well, who's going to be so silly to do something against the laws of physics? And my answer would be plenty of people. For instance, anybody who uses homeopathic medicine is doing something against the laws of physics. Um, he's thinking that, uh, that diluted sugar, uh, essentially, and water uh, will, will cure diseases. That's nonsense. And a stoic would say, no, don't do it, because that means you don't understand the nature of the universe. Or I don't know if you remember, several years ago, there was this uh, um, very, unfortunately, highly successful uh, book and DVD that came out. It was called um, um, uh, The Secret. Right. Yeah. So The Secret is based on, a, on an incorrect understanding of the universe, essentially. Right. So, so The Secret says that if you really want something, if you really truly want something like, you know, a new job or a new relationship or whatever it is, uh, then the universe will somehow sort of bend and, and, and recognize that, that um, 
No, it doesn't work like that. In fact, Epictetus, uh, 2,000 years ago, you know, almost 2,000 years ago, explicitly wrote that it doesn't work that way. One of his students was complaining because he had a broken leg. And Epictetus says, well, what do you want? That the, the universe just changes things around so that your bracket, leg is not broken? Yeah, deal with it. You got a broken leg. Well, worse things can happen. Um, so, so one level of the, the phrase living according to nature means just live your life according to your best understanding of how the world actually works and not according to how you would want the world to work. So it's essentially, it's a, it's a way of saying, don't engage in, in, in uh, you know, wishful thinking. But the other, the second part, I think is even more important, the one about human nature. So the Stoics thought that there are two fundamental aspects to human nature. One is that we are eminently uh, uh, social organisms. We, we can, if, if we need to, we can survive in isolation, but mm -hmm. we only thrive in, in social groups. Mm. So we're eminently social. And the second component is that we are also capable of reason. We're the only animal, or at least the animal in which reason has really achieved um, sort of levels that are not found anywhere else in nature. Right. From these two things, they concluded that, therefore, a good life for a human being is a life in which you apply reason to improve social living. Oh, okay. So, so the meaning of life, according to Stoics, is precisely that. And Marcus Aurelius says it explicitly in the meditation. He says, you know, do whatever uh, uh, social reason demands and only whatever social reason demands, because that's the whole point. The point of living a human life is to be helpful to others, make things better for everybody, which means, of course, making things better for yourself. So, so Massimo, let's let's just take a, a little bit of a pause. I, I, you're you're feeding us so much information, which I love so much. But <laughs> I, I want to just I just want to backtrack a little bit, and I want to cover. You mentioned Marcus Aurelius. I find his life fascinating. I think. I think it's so interesting, the story behind everything he was doing, the position that he was in, but I'll let you tell the story. Um, can you tell us more about Marcus Aurelius his, and his life as an emperor and what he was doing when he wrote Meditations? Well, I started at the end then, because he wrote the Meditations near the end of his life. We don't know exactly which years, but close to the end of his life. And in fact, he was on the frontier, uh, you know, fighting an eight-year-long war against the Marcomanni and other German tribes. Uh, these tribes had uh, essentially tried to, to invade Roman territory. There had been some negotiation. Uh, in, in, the interesting bit actually about this is that not only this was a defensive war that Marcus was, was doing, but in fact, uh, it was a war uh, that uh, resulted out of the fact that the Marcomanni actually wanted to be part of the Roman sort of ecosystem. They wanted to be able to, to trade as equal partners with the Romans. And so there was some disagreement essentially on, on economics, if you, if you will. Um, and as often is the case, when disagreements of economics cannot be resolved diplomatically, then people start you know, taking up arms. So uh, Marcus found himself, he did not want to wage war, but he found himself in, on the frontier near the end of his life. Um, and uh, this is where he wrote the meditations. We know this for a number of reasons. And for one thing, because of his correspondence with some of his friends and associates, but also because two chapters, two volumes of the meditations actually explicitly say that they were written in, you know, in the field and, and they mm. give the location. Mm -hmm. um, so we know where, where he was. Now, Marcus had arrived there. He, he was uh, in, a, in a very interesting way. So first of all, he was one of the so-called five good emperors. Uh, there was a, a period, this was the peak of the Roman Empire. The, the, the Roman Empire was it, it, its most peaceful as well as its most extensive mm -hmm. during the, the, the reigns of these five emperors, which included Adrian and, Mar and, and Antoninus Pius. Antoninus Pius was Marcus' uh, adoptive father. Okay. So Adrian, in fact, had suggested to Antoninus, uh, to, to, um, um, Antoninus Pius that he should adopt Marcus because Adrian saw in Marcus, the young Marcus, uh, somebody who had the, the chops. He had what it, what it took to, to um, become an emperor. So Marcus was basically raised in Antoninus Pius' household and you know, palace. Uh, he was uh, uh, given instructions, you know, education accordingly. Uh, and he studied philosophy since he was very young. He studied with a number of philosophers, uh, not just Stoics. He, he was sort of uh, looking at different philosophical approaches. He also studied rhetoric. He studied a number of, a number of things. But apparently, since he was very young, he, uh, Stoicism is the thing that clicked with him. Okay. Uh, his, his Stoic teachers 
uh, were the ones that made the most impression, and he sort of stuck tried to, to start practicing stoicism to the point that his mother got worried for this because as a boy, um, he started sleeping on the floor in order to, uh, instead of a, in a in bed. In poverty. In order to, yeah, right. So, so to, to remind himself that he could cope with adversity. And his mother said, none, none of this nonsense. You, you need to wow. Uh, <laughs> that sort of stuff. Now, eventually, after Antonius Pius died, uh, Marcus became emperor. In fact, he became co-emperor. He decided to share uh, the empire uh, with Marcus Verus, uh, who was not exactly the best, uh, you know, co-emperor, but he did his job. He did okay. He did okay. And then at some point, Verus died, uh, and Marcus became the sole emperor in charge of of, uh, of everything. This was a trial, you know, a pretty difficult time. As I said, the five emperors did oversee a, a time of peace and prosperity for the Roman Empire, but when it came to Marcus, he was pretty unlucky. Mm -hmm. He had to face uh, one war on the eastern frontier against the Parthians, who were, you know, one of Rome's regular standby enemies. Um, uh, the second war later on, as I mentioned, on the German frontier, he also faced an internal rebellion. One of his trusted um, lieutenants at some point declared himself emperor, so they had to be dealt with. And most importantly, uh, he had to deal with a plague that was in brought back to Rome by the legions coming back from the east. And plague was the, the uh, worst recorded in ancient history. It probably killed between three and five million people. Hmm. That's a lot to deal with uh, during, <laughs> during someone's reigns. And so what you see in the meditations is essentially Marcus coming to terms with all this stuff. You know, how do, you, how do I deal with things? How do I cope with uh, the stress and the, the fact that some of my own people are sort of betraying me. Apparently, his wife was not faithful either, so that was another problem. Oh, no. And uh, the meditation session essentially a personal diary where Marcus is made up of 12 books, so-called, but in fact, it's like it's one book with 12 chapters, really. And uh, in, in each book, you, you see Marcus going over and over on the, the same themes. Uh, in fact, one of the criticisms that people have of the meditations is that it is repetitive and it, then it's preachy. But that's to be understood. Uh, uh, you know, it's of course it was repetitive. It's somebody's diary, personal diary. Sure. So presumably you, you, you run into the same problems over and over, so you write about the same problems over and over. And as far as preachiness is concerned, well, he was preaching to himself. He was, he was telling himself. I mean, he never like, meant to be on. published. Like th this was not his, it was not his intention to publish this journal that he was writing for himself. And right. I mean, he, know he had, you know, he had anything at his disposal that he wanted. He was emperor, you know, so yes, he had exactly. all the money that he wanted. I mean, people were bothering him for something every day. So, I mean, what was something that Marcus said that sort of hit home with you? Like, I think in a paraphrase, I think he said something like, you know, people will ask you for money today. They will annoy you. They will bother you. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I thought it was really amazing that this, the post this, this person has become, you know, such a, a, almost a literary genius. Like, you know, like yeah. he's putting out this, this philosophy without the intention of doing that, which is which gives it this whole other color and dimension that I find fascinating about his life. Yeah, that, no, that's exactly right. In fact, the bit that you're you're thinking of is one of my favorite quotes from from the Meditations, where he says, "You know, start out. Remember, you should start out every morning expecting that people are going to be nasty and treacherous and you know vile and so on and so forth." This was his his uh, normal sort of experience of the of the world. He says, I, you know, don't expect otherwise. I mean, to expect otherwise, it's, it's like, uh, you know, expecting uh, a fig to be in flower in the winter, uh, to use actually a metaphor that comes out of Epictetus. It's like, that, that would be silly. It would be irrational. This is one of those things, again, that, that goes back to the economy of control with which we started this conversation, right? So you don't, don't expect that people all of a sudden change and become great and good and everything. You just deal with what they, what they, what they actually are, not with the way in which you want them to be. But then he goes on in the same, in the very same paragraph. He says, but, you know, remember, you have also made mistakes. You've also been annoyed and you've also been, you know, uh, uh, creating problems from others. And not only that, you know, everybody does that, uh, does what they what they do because they think that they're right. I mean, you, don't, you, you rarely encounter somebody who's decided and you know, bent on doing the wrong thing, knowing that it's the wrong thing. Uh, people 
are in good faith usually. They, they, they think that they're doing what the right thing is. They're, they may be mistaken and they may be annoying as a result or, or creating problems as a result. But, you know, you need to sort of understand where they're coming from. Hmm. And then finally he says, still in the same paragraph, in the, in the same section, he says, regardless of all of this, this should not touch you because what you can do is always to retreat in yourself and think about what is the right thing to do and do it. Regardless of what other people think or regardless of what other people do, it is up to you to do the right thing. Again, this is another application of the dichotomy of control. Mm-hmm. He's saying, look, you don't control what other people do, but you do control how you react to that. You do control what you do. You, you do control your own judgments, your own decisions to act or not to act. So focus on those and you'll be fine. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very uh, wise way of sort of approaching, approaching problems. Meditations also starts out, the entire first chapter in the meditation, it's called the first book, as I said, but it's, it's a chapter. The first chapter on the meditations really is an, a long exercise in gratitude. He starts out by saying, you know, I'm thankful to my father for this, my mother for that, my grandfather for this, my friends for this, uh, my teachers, and so on and so forth. It's a great example of literally, as you were saying a minute ago, the most powerful man in the Western world at the time Hmm. that begins his own diary by reminding himself that he's got to that point of power and, 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 you know, uh, of, of prestige and everything because of countless people who have been good to him and who have influenced him for the better. And it, it's a great, it's a great and, you know, ex- exercise in humility, essentially, in, in being grateful to people, which uh, we all could use a little bit more of. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, I love, I love the idea of his life and, and at the limits he was tested, I, I would say he was probably one of, I mean, the greatest ruler that we've seen in, you know, in recent times and in ancient history times. Um, it, it doesn't seem like there's a, a ruler that I've heard of that is so balanced and thinking so clearly about right. how to rule, how to govern, how to deal with, um, you know, everyday sort of problems and issues and really yeah. addressing, you know, really addressing that you're, you're going to deal with shit. It's, it's going to come up, it's, whether it's exactly. from other people or whether, you know, maybe the livestock, you know, there's a plague and the livestock all dies or, you know, something happens, but it's going to test you. It's going to test that inner yeah. resolve that you have. And I think if we circle bra- back and we, we add this into our lives today, you know, we have technology, we're connected all the time to our devices. We're, we're online. So it presents a new way of sort of giving problems, you know, because I can read, you know, Mas- I can go to Massimo's Facebook page and pull up I'm like, Massimo, you were having dinner. We, we were supposed to go to dinner. W- what happened? <laughs> you know what right. I mean? So, That's right. So it, it's really interesting to connect such an ancient philosophy to modern day living. Oh, so absolutely. So, so one thing that I think social media does for me, you know, I have to use social media for a number of reasons. Some of them are sort of personal because most of my family, uh, for instance, is in Italy and I live in New York. So it's, it's a nice way to connect and you know, stay in touch with my brothers, my sister, my nephew, my niece, etc. And, and some of it is professional, right? I, um, I use you know, Twitter and Facebook as you know, to broadcast my, my professional writings, to learn about other people's writings and so on. So I have to be essentially, I, you know, I mean, I have a choice. I could decide not to do it, but it's a very good thing for me to do. That said, almost every day when I get on Twitter or, or, or Facebook, it's, a, it's an exercise in stoic resilience mm. because, of course, somebody's going to troll me, somebody's going to be nasty, somebody's going to be doing this or that or the other. And you wonder, it's like, what, what are these people thinking? Why are these people doing this? But if you take it as a challenge, remember I mentioned the, the, the notion, Bill Irvine's notion of the, you know, the gods, uh, the stoic gods are throwing you a challenge. If you think of it in terms of a challenge, then you say, okay, well, let me see. How, how can I cope better with people who are, in fact, annoying or insulting or something like that? And it really helps. I mean, my, <laughs> okay, my tell behavior me, online, tell me more. it's amazing. It's amazing. My, my behavior online has improved dramatically for the last several years because every time I go in, I'm, prepa- I'm mentally prepared. So, okay, here, here goes another stoic challenge. Let's see how you can do it. And when you do a challenge to yourself, you automatically pay attention. You automatically try to sort of do 
do better. And you say, aha, this guy, I know what this guy is trying to do. He's trying to get a nasty response out of me. I'm just not going to do that. Um, Stoics were really big on, on uh, insults, as in not, not doing insults, but, but on, on handling insults. Mm. Uh, so Epictetus, for instance, says that um, there's two ways to deal with an insult. The, the basic one, which is easily accessible to everyone, is to react to an insult as a rock would. So I actually have some of my students do uh, this as an exercise. You, you, I said, you know, go out in, in, the, in, the, in the backyard, pick up a rock, and then start insulting it. Mm-hmm. How, how does that feel? <laughs> and of course, they do it. And, and of course, they say, well, if I feel like an idiot. Mm. I say, exactly. That's the point. <laughs> if somebody insults you and you don't respond, they are going to feel like idiots. Because the point of an insult is to get a reaction out of it. Right. If you don't get the reaction, if the, if the person who insults you doesn't get a reaction, he feels he's like, well, what's going on here? What, what am I missing? Precisely, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so, and so that's an easy thing to do. It's, it's like, well, somewhat easy. It's, it actually requires some training. But, but it's readily easy to do. It's just don't react. Just walk away. The more sophisticated reaction uh, to an insult is also... Um, brought up by, by Epictetus, and Epictetus says, uh, uh, so there's a bit in the, in, the, in the discourses where one of his students says, hey, I, I heard this guy, He's, you know, he has all sorts of bad things to say about you, you know, he said this and that, and he insulted you. And Epictetus' response uh, is, oh, well, that's because he, he doesn't know me well, otherwise he could have said much worse. Mm-hmm. So in other words, you use humor to diffuse a situation. Uh, I mentioned Bill Irvine, my colleague, and friend earlier and he has this this example uh, where uh, years ago he was you know, he's a philosopher he's a professional philosopher so years ago he was walking in, in the halls of his department and a colleague stops him and says oh bill i was just thinking you know i'm finishing writing my book and i was just thinking of of mentioning your work mm-hmm. and you know bill's natural immediate reaction was to think oh well, that's nice there's a colleague who recognizes my work but before he could say that say anything the colleague goes on and says, yeah, the problem is that I, I haven't decided yet whether what you wrote is misguided, which is wrong, or downright evil. So Bill thought for a second, remembered Epictetus, and he, and he answered, well, why not both? And then walked away. Hmm. And the colleague was stunned because, like, what are you going to say at that point? <laughs> so somebody has basically not only deflected the insult, but in fact, sort of like a boomerang, throw it back at you. It's like, oh, you could have run worse, and I don't care. That's mm-hmm. your opinion. That's in your, under, your, under your control. Under my control is to simply ignore you because you're beneath my, uh, my notice. I just sure. don't. I don't care. Sure. I, don't, I don't give a damn about it. So this is something that people can, in fact, um, uh, practice on a regular basis because there are all sorts of opportunities to do so, you know, on the job, with, sometimes with friends, sometimes with relatives. I mean, imagine, you know, your typical Thanksgiving dinner where your insane uncle is going on on racist rants or something like that. Um, you know, there, there are countless opportunities, and of course, including the ones online, to feel insulted and to react to the insult. In fact, we kind of live in a, in a society at this point where outrage and insults are just flying all over the place. But try a little stoic approach and see. Next time around, either in completely ignore the insult or deflect it by, uh, by way of humor and see how it feels. I, I really, when, since I started doing that, I feel so much better myself. And I know that I pissed off a lot of people. <laughs> no, I know for sure that, you know, when you're in that state of where you expect someone respond to respond to and you're like almost goading them you're poking them you're pushing them right. and you you want you're looking for that feedback and when you when someone expects you to be enraged and you give them no response at all it it enrages them further which is which yes. is beautiful it, it's it's almost good. like right. deflecting an attack there's right. a there's a quote from epictetus that i really really like uh it says who then is invincible the one who cannot be upset by anything outside their reason choice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because your reactions to you, so you are in complete control. If you train yourself well, uh, you are in complete control of your reaction. Now, let me make a, a point here. It, it's an important caveat. Because sometimes people misunderstand what, what we're talking about and say, oh, but what do you mean? I mean, I, I feel I cannot avoid getting upset if somebody, you know, 
insult me or, or I cannot avoid being angry or something. Well, let's talk about what exactly you can and you cannot avoid. The, the immediate reaction is unavoidable. The, this is what the Stoics call the proto-emotion. So, um, you know, the little anger that you feel is welling inside you when somebody starts saying something that you think is insulting or stupid or something. That's, that's, not, that's not avoidable. That's just a natural reaction. Uh, or that little, you know, instantaneous fear that you feel if you hear a loud noise all of a sudden that you're not expecting. That kind of, you know, immediate or automatic reaction. Those things you do not control, you cannot control, and the Stoics never said that you should try to control them. They're just natural reactions. Mm -hmm. However, both the Stoics and modern cognitive scientists thought that the, the mature emotion, what they actually called a passion, but the mature emotion is a combination of the proto-emotion and of your cognition, of the fact that you're thinking about things in a certain way. So you cannot avoid the proto-emotion, but you can definitely work on the fully, the fully fledged emotion because that one includes a cognitive part. That, that includes a judgment. So, for instance, if you say, you know, well, I cannot avoid feeling, you know, a little disturbed by somebody who is insulting me. That's true. You cannot, you cannot avoid it. Mm -hmm. But then you can stop yourself and say, okay, this guy just doesn't know what he's talking about. It's just opening his mouth and, and, and air comes out of it and I'm not hearing it. That's up to you to, uh, to modify your judgment instead of going, oh yeah, I have plenty of reasons to get upset. In fact, I'm gonna be really upset that I'm gonna be punching on the nose or something. And instead of doing that, so in other words, feed on your, on your proto-emotion until it develops a full-fledged anger, you can actually do exactly the opposite and say, what am I upset about? The guy's just talking, so what? Right. That doesn't make that doesn't make any difference in my life. That's not going to affect me. Right. Uh, similar with you know the loud bang, you know the noise. Well, if the, if it turns out that the noise is in fact you know somebody shooting a revolver, then you might want to take cover. But more likely than not, it isn't. It's just you know something outside happened, and you know so, or something inside your your apartment fell down. It's like okay, well that's not a big deal. No reason to get upset. So you calm down immediately. So a lot of the way in which we react to things is under our control, not in the sense that we can avoid the proto-emotion, but in the sense that we can actually reason through things. In a sense, it's kind of the opposite of the famous commercial, right? Instead of just do it, the Stoics <laughs> would say, yeah. stop. Yeah, stop and think about it. <laughs> yeah. it, may, it may very well be that then you want to do it. I mean, it's not, you know, the notion isn't that you always end up concluding that there is no action to be taken. Sometimes there is an action to be taken. For instance, uh, if, let's say, a co-worker is being harassed by your boss, well, there is an action to be taken there uh, because one of the fundamental stoic virtues is the virtue of justice. And you should intervene. If you see an injustice being done, you should intervene and try to uh, you know, counter it as much as possible. So sometimes your judgment is that, yeah, you should act. But a lot of the times, your judgment is going to be, you know, if you think about it, it's like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> it's just it's not worth my energy. It's not worth getting upset about it. For sure. So, so Massimo, let me. I'm gonna have to reel you back in, man. You're just you're your own. You're your own person. You just developed a topic all by yourself. It's great. I mean, I love hearing you talk. Don't get me wrong, uh, but you're like your own segue artist. So, okay. So, um, you know, I want to I want to talk about virtues. You know, because the Stoics were very strong about living an honorable life, and you know, the different virtues that we should embody in in our actions and what we do and and who we are so so what are some of the cardinal virtues please right so the stoics did first of all stoicism is a type of virtual ethics uh there are several different kinds of virtual ethics uh the most famous one is aristotle's uh then there is epicureanism there, there's a number of them stoicism is one type is one version of virtual ethics and what they all have in common is um as you were saying that we are supposed to act uh, following certain virtues. Virtues are, are essentially propensities to act in one way or another. They're, they're part of our character. They're part of who we are. The Stoics in particular recognize four cardinal virtues, four fundamental virtues. And these are practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. Practical wisdom is the knowledge of what is good for you and what is not good for you. And for the Stoics, really, that boiled down to a very simple thing. We're going back again to the dichotomy of control. Mm -hmm. Whatever is good for you is what it's under your control. 
control, whatever is, uh, and you do right, and whatever is bad for you is what is under your control, you don't do right. So in other words, your good judgments are good for you, your bad judgments are bad for you, and nothing else. Everything else is not under your control, so you should simply ignore it. Mm -hmm. So that's practical wisdom, which means in, 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 a, uh, in practice, so to speak, that everything you do, you should ask yourself the, the basic question. Is this under my control or is it not? So that's practical wisdom. Courage is not just physical courage, but the, the courage to stand up and do the right thing. So mm -hmm. it's really moral courage. Well, what's the right thing? Well, the right thing is what, uh, what concerns the third um, uh, virtue, the virtue of justice. Justice tells you that you should be treating other people fairly, you should be treating other people as you want it to be uh, treated, and you should never treat other people as means to an end, but as ends in themselves. In other words, you should recognize them as human beings that are inherently worthy of respect. They're not your tools. They're not something to play with. They are, they are human beings just like you. And then finally, temperance essentially means that you need to react to situations in the proper measure, neither too much nor too little. So let me go back to my example of the boss that is harassing a co-worker, right? Mm -hmm. What is practical wisdom telling me? Well, that I can arrive at a judgment that, uh, that what the boss is doing is in fact incorrect and I can do something about it. I may not be able to change the boss's mind. I may not be able to stop the behavior, but I can certainly try to intervene. That is under my control. So mm -hmm. I should intervene. Right. Courage tells me that I should summon the courage to intervene. It's not just a theoretical thing. Uh, I actually need to do it in practice, and that may take courage because, after all, he's my boss, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I could suffer consequences from intervening. So I need, so, so I need courage. Justice tells me that, in fact, arresting a co a, co uh, a, a worker is not a good thing. It's unjust in, in because it is not treating the person with respect. And temperance tells me that. I need to do it pro to react properly. I don't want to just whisper something under my breath because my boss is not going to hear it. That would be underreacting. But I also don't want to go and punch him on the nose sure. because that would be overreacting. Sure. Right? So I need to act with temper. I need to just stand firm and say clearly and, and with calm. It's like, you know, this kind of behavior is really not acceptable. So that's, those are the fundamental features. And the way the Stoics use them is as uh, uh, as moral compass. So imagine that you know you, when you navigate around your know, city, you need a map. You have a compass. Uh, when you when you navigate a ship, you need a, or an airplane, you need a compass to know where you're going. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, of course, compasses do have four cardinal points, mm -hmm. right? North, mm -hmm. south, east, yes. and west. Yeah. Um, and the same goes for the four cardinal virtues. Essentially, the notion is that every time you are in a situation, a difficult situation, or a situation where you have to make a decision. You should ask yourself, well, is this under my control or not? Is this a courageous thing to do? Is this a just thing to do? And am I reacting temperately? Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, if I think if we brought this into, you know, instead of putting on the Kardashians or some mainstream garbage, <laughs> if we talked more about virtue, wisdom, justice, courage, and temperance, I mean, I think maybe we would make leaps and bounds. And I mean, it's to be said that such an ancient, do you think, this leads me to my next question, do you think that there was, I mean, for the research for the show, I was looking at the links between Buddhism and Stoicism, and there seems to be a, an interesting parallel between those things. Like, I think Buddhism originated about 2,500 years ago, whereas Stoic, Stoicism was about 2,300 years ago. So Buddhism right. is a little bit older, and yeah. uh, and and Buddhism adds in a sort of spiritual like enlightenment, the path, the way you know they, they talk about right. suffering as well. So I mean, it seems like there are many links in into these two systems of thought. There are absolutely. Uh, we don't know. We don't think, at least, that those links are, are the result of direct influence. Although uh, there was a um, ancient Greek philosopher, important ancient Greek philosopher, Pyrrho was a skeptic, in the original sense of the term, uh, and therefore not a Stoic, uh, who was who did go to India with Alexander the Great, and we know that he was in contact, he came in contact with Buddhist monks. And Buddhism was right at the beginning uh, at the time. So, and interestingly, we don't actually have written down books from Buddhism of that time. So it's, it's at least possible, people have speculated, that there are some reciprocal influences that, that Pyrrho brought back to Greece 
some influences from Buddhism, and that vice versa, he influenced very, very early uh, Buddhism. Unfortunately, we don't know. We, we, the only thing we know is that he went there and, and he did have contacts. We don't, we don't really have much of a sense of how much of an influence it was uh, either way. Mm-hmm. But you're absolutely right that there are strong similarities between Buddhism and Stoicism. In fact, I typically think of, you know, I present Stoicism as the Western um, it's, those are not the only two that are similar. That are, I mentioned earlier similarities with certain aspects of Christianity, you know, the Serenity Prayer, uh, or even of medieval Judaism. There are also strong similarities between both Buddhism and, and Stoicism and other Eastern uh, philosophies, like such as Taoism, for instance. But the ones between Buddhism and Stoicism are particularly strong. Mm-hmm. The two philosophies differ dramatically in terms of metaphysics. So let me step back uh, for a second uh, to give a little bit of background. Sure, I sure. think that every philosophy of life, such as Buddhism, Stoicism, Epicureanism, etc., but also every religion, uh, Christianity, Judaism, Confucianism, whatever you want, they all of, all of those have two components, at least two components, a metaphysics, which means an account of how the world works, and an ethics which is an account of how you should work within the work, the world, how do you should act within the world. So if you think about every religion, take Christianity, for instance, Christianity does have a metaphysics, it has an account of how the world actually works, it was created by God, and so on and so forth. There's a providence, etc. And then there's, of course, the ethics, you know, what, is, what are you supposed to do if you're a good Christian in order to be a good Christian? The same exact thing goes for every other philosophy or religion of life that I know of including, therefore, Buddhism. Now, the difference between Buddhism and, and big, the big differences between Buddhism and Stoicism are in the metaphysics. Okay. The two metaphysics are very different. The Stoics, as we were saying earlier, were clearly materialists. They thought that the universe itself, God, the soul, everything is made of matter. Okay. Everything is made of stuff. Okay. While on the other hand, Buddhist metaphysics is more uh, esoteric. It's more, you know, they do believe in reincarnation, for instance, or in things like karma, uh, stuff like that. There's nothing like that in Stoicism. But despite those very different, you know, very different metaphysics, their ethics are very, very similar. You can, you can have, you know, the uh, Buddhists, of course, have the, the Four no- Noble Truths and the Eightfold uh, Path to Wisdom and so on and so forth. Uh, concepts, they have concepts such as non-attachment, um, and etc., proper action, proper intention, and so on and so forth. Well, the Stoics is something very similar. They have virtues, they have to take under control. Uh, they work out, they, they use different names, but they work out about the same same approach in, in practice. So there are very strong similarities. Now, you mentioned enlightenment, which is kind of an interesting concept, because, of course, the, in the Buddhist tradition, enlightenment is in a, it also, uh, you know, uh, has, has a metaphysical sort of component to it. Certain things happen when you become enlightened. But the Stoics do have an equivalent of the enlightenment, and that's called ataraxia. Ataraxia means serenity or tranquility. Mm-hmm. And basically the notion is that if you actually act like a stoic in life, you will achieve ataraxia. You will be serene. And you will be serene because you will always do whatever it is under your control and you will always accept with serenity uh, everything else that you cannot control. You'll say, well, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Today I lost. Well, that's too bad, but you know, there's going to be a next time. Okay. And that kind of attitude toward things that happen to you brings serenity and brings what, what uh, a, sta- a, a state of mind that the Stoics refer to as ataraxia. Now, the difference between ataraxia and enlightenment is that in Buddhism, en- enlightenment is in, sen- in, in, a, in a very strong sense, at least from what I understand it, it's a goal. It's, it's one of the things you want to do. You want to achieve enlightenment. Um, for the Stoics, ataraxia is a side product. It's a nice side product, but it's a side product nonetheless. Uh, the goal for, uh, for a Stoic is not to achieve ataraxia, it's not to achieve serenity. Um, it's the, the goal is to behave morally, is to be a good human being, essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, interestingly, the word virtue that we've been using before, uh, you know, unfortunately in English it sounds a little weird, um, be, largely because it has sort of very strong Christian connotations. But virtue in the original Greek is arete, and arete just means excellence. So what the Stoics are trying to say is that we should try to be excellent human beings, the best human beings you can. Mm-hmm. Well, what does that mean? 
uh, I mentioned earlier, living according to nature. Well, the best human beings are the human beings that live to the fullest potential of what a human being can do. And that, according to the Stoics, is to live socially and reasonably. So the more reasonable you are, the more sociable you are, meaning you're helping society, not, not that you have any um, then, then you, the more excellent of a human being you are. So the goal in Stoicism is to become an excellent human being, the best human being you can. Mm. As a consequence, if you get there, if you become what the Stoics call the sage, which would be the equivalent of a Buddhist you know, enlightenment, sure. then you also achieve ataraxia, also achieve complete serenity of mind. Yeah, what an amazing concept, this idea of, you know, tranquility within oneself uh, while, you know, living. I think that's, I think that's the, the key here. You know, were the Stoics meditators? Did they meditate? Well, so the word meditation uh, has, of course, different connotations in different sure, traditions. Sure. And in fact, even within, I mean, it has many different connotations, some of which are actually similar to the Stoic one and some of which are very different. So most Westerners who have heard of Buddhism, they tend to think about Zen meditation and things like that. And so those are exercises you do in order to empty your minds of thought, you know, focus on a, on a mantra, uh, you know, let your thoughts go, uh, essentially. Uh, that kind of meditation is not found in Stoicism. But there are Buddhist meditations in other traditions, in other Buddhist traditions that are much more similar to what the Stoics think of as a meditation. I mean, after all, the title... The common title of Marcus Aurelius' book is the meditations. Right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> um, but meditation here, in that in the Stoic sense, means reflection. So you want to reflect on certain things. You write your uh, your diary, your philosophical diary, uh, so that you can learn from your experiences. Uh, Seneca actually gives specific instructions on how to do this, and Epictetus does as well. Seneca says you should you should wait until the evening. Before you go to bed, don't do it in your bed because you're going to fall asleep. But before you go to bed, find a, mom a moment of quiet and a place of quiet in your house or in your apartment. And then write down uh, the answer to the following questions. Ask yourself today, what did you do wrong? What did you do right? And what you could do, could you do better? And the point is, you want to know what you did wrong, not because you want to indulge in regret and flagellate yourself or something like that. that that's pointless because the past is outside of your control mm -hmm. but you do want to learn from your mistakes so writing them down writing down things like well today i did this and i shouldn't have done it that is a way to fix that memory uh in your psyche a way to pay attention to the fact that you did do something oh, I'd love the that. second thing is right so what 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 did they do right because uh Stoicism is also a very self-forgiving and other-forgiving kind of uh, philosophy. Great. There are things you did right, I'm sure. So pat yourself on the back mm -hmm. because it's good. You need to pay attention to the things that you did right uh, just as much to, as to the things you did wrong. Because after all, in the long run, the whole point is to move away as much as possible from the bad things and move away as, toward as much as possible the good things. So basically what you, you can think of your practice as a way to alter the balance, uh, diminish as much as possible the bad things or the, your mistakes and increase as much as possible the good things. And then the third question is, what could I do better? Well, the reason for asking yourself that question is because often we encounter the same or very similar situations, hmm. right? You, you go to work every day, you see the same people, you, you run into similar situations or you go and you have your family and you come back. And again, you know, you're going to end up in a very similar situation you're with your friends and so on and so forth. And so maybe today you did not react well on your job or, or with your friend or with your partner. But, you know, the same thing or something very similar is going to happen again tomorrow or next week. And so if you pay attention and you ask yourself, well, what could I do better? Well, how, how is it going to be better the next time around? How am I going to react better the next time around? Again, that's that because you write it down, that's forcing you to pay attention. It's essentially, in a sense, making a plan for the future and say, okay, well, the next time that something like this happens, here's what, what I'm going to do. And you do that, you know, if not every day. Um, Seneca says, actually, every day. You know, I don't do it every day. I do it several times a week. Uh, you know, whenever the, the need arises, I mean, 
you may have entire days where you don't actually do anything that's particularly noteworthy, <laughs> either it's bad or good. Right? I mean, it's, it's totally right. necessary to have these types of tools that we can use cognitively that we, where, yeah. you know, whether it's writing down, you know, these things that you feel you've done wrong every day at the end of every day before you go to bed, it, 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 for me, uh, you know, I've, I've practiced this a little bit, uh, you know, inconsistent, but, um, you know, it, it leaves me with a sense of being clean at the end of the day. Yeah, and, that's right. And, and I, it, it, it's almost like a, a unloading sort of phase. I mean, the, the Stoics had these sort of cognitive behavioral therapies that they practiced. I mean, if, and yes. so I, I want, it leads me in perfect segue into the, uh, the premeditatio malorum. Am I saying that yes, correctly? Yes, that's right. Yeah, premeditatio malorum, yes. Okay. And what thinking is, about bad shit happening. <laughs> thinking about bad shit happening. Okay. <laughs> I um, so it's interesting you mentioned the C CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which is one of the most successful evidence-based kinds of therapies that you can do today, psychotherapy. You can do today. And interestingly, uh, CBT started out in a couple of different forms, one of which was called rational emotive behavioral therapy, and still, yes, actually. And early on in the 1950s and 60s, the people that got CBT started actually did it expressly by uh, inspiring themselves to the Stoics and particularly to Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. Hmm. So there are a lot of similarities between CBT and Stoicism. Of course, Stoicism is a philosophy of life, so it's not just it's not a therapy, it's not just a therapy. You're not supposed to use it only when you have a problem. Uh, while on the other hand, CBT tends to be more specific, more targeted. You know, if you have a phobia or if you have a, an issue like depression or something like that, uh, then you can go to a CBT practitioner to deal with it. Uh, you can think, however, of, of stoicism as a sort of a CBT for life in general. People have normal kinds of day-to-day -day, um, problems. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's the relationship basically be between uh, uh, between the two. Um, they work in the eye as I said, CBT is evidence-based, and therefore stoic techniques work in a very similar way. Now, let's go back to the presentation model just as an example. Uh, so, premeditatio malorum, or the exposure to adversity, uh, is in fact does find an analogy in CBT, and uh, uh, CBT practitioners call it an exposure to a negative stimulus or a mm -hmm. stimulus that you want to avoid. So, let's say, for instance, that uh, you have a phobia. One of my favorite uh, is phobia of buttons. Some people, for whatever reason, have a phobia of they're scared of buttons, okay. which you would think, yeah, which you would a think phobia is, is, of buttons. That's right. Yes. Okay, okay. Some people do have that. There's, it's a, it's a clinical condition, and of course, there's no actual reason to be uh, afraid of buttons. But you know, people have some people have a phobia. So the way a uh, CBT practitioner would go about it is, first of all, to let you imagine uh, the button. You know, before you actually go in near it or you touch it or handle it or anything, you, you imagine it and you and, it's, and you start imagining. You know, what's the worst thing that can happen? When I handle a bug, is it going to bite me? No. Is it going to poison me? No. Is it going to do something really bad to me? No. So you you habituate yourself mentally first. Mentally, and, uh, this is typically done in modern times. It's done as an actual visualization exercise. You close your your, your mind, your, your eyes, and then you start thinking your mind as if you were looking at a movie, watching a movie, or yourself doing that thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually, you graduate CBT. You actually graduate to actually getting exposed to the stimulus directly to actually see the button then handle the button and so on until eventually you, you'd be able to overcome your your fear now in the case of the profenditatio malorum there are examples of this kind of technique that are found uh, in marcus aurelius and in seneca and basically what they're doing is they they are asking themselves the question you know, so what's the worst outcome possibly what's the worst thing that can happen so if i go let's say Let's, let's, let's use a practical example. Let's say that tomorrow morning I have a job interview, mm -hmm. right? Well, it, one way to do a premeditatio, there's different ways. One can do it in visualization, I just said it. CBT um, practitioners do it, so you can just close your eyes and imagine yourself into the interview and so on. Um, another one is as, as a diary. You can write down, you know, so let the scenario. So what's going to happen? Uh, or you can talk to somebody about the scenario. You, there's a number of different ways of doing it. But... Let's say I, I need to go tomorrow for this interview and I'm, you know, so I, I'm concerned, worried about this thing. Well, the first thing you're going to ask yourself is, so what's the worst thing that can happen? 
I don't get a job. Mm-hmm. Fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not the end of the world. I'll, I can survive. Um, there will be other jobs. <laughs> there will be other interviews. Um, you know, or well, it's the worst thing that can happen. Well, I, I make a fool of myself in the interview. Well, you know, <laughs> worst things happen at sea, as Bannon used to say. Um, you know, it's not the end of the world. We all embarrass ourselves. Sure. And, uh, you know, you're probably never going to meet that person again anyway. So you start by working yourself with the worst possible scenario, and then you work yourself back and say, yeah, but that's the worst thing. What's the next worst thing? Can happen? Oh, you know, you're doing an interview, you're doing well, and you're not quite getting the job, but you're, you know, in the final list. Well, that's good. Well, what's the next thing that can happen? Well, the next thing that can happen, actually, you do a really good interview and you're doing really well and you actually get the job and so on. So the notion is to be prepared for the worst on the grounds that, that A, the worst isn't going to be something you cannot bear. You, you will be able to deal with it, especially if you're prepared mentally with, uh, for that. And two, the worst is actually unlikely to happen. Right. It's, it's, not, it's not a guarantee. It's not that you know that you're going to fail. It's possible, in fact, sometimes it's likely that things are going to be better than you, than you think. So it's a way of reminding yourself that even the worst case scenario is not quite as bad as you might think, and also that you are capable of enjoying it, that you're exactly. capable of withstanding it. Exactly. If I mean, if we put in front of us like the worst possible thing that can happen, and we, it's it's almost a form of understanding better, you know, okay, like rationalizing fears, you know, like so in some way by seeing this written down on a piece of paper in front of you, you're you're realizing, okay, well, there are ways that I can deal with this if in the the unlikely chance that it does happen. Most most yeah. likely, it's, this none of this stuff is going, going going to occur. The the interview has gone perfectly so far, minus our you know small technical issues, but it's been a great conversation, and I think we've covered some amazing topics that you know will really benefit people. So then you know shifting shifting over once you realize okay like i i'm i've listed down all of my fears in the worst case scenarios then you know perhaps writing down okay what are some of the best what are the best things that can come out of this scenario as well yeah yeah exactly now there is one exception to all this which is a big one as far as the stoics are concerned that's death one thing you are not going to overcome <laughs> it's sure. death right and so the stoics just like the, the epicureans actually write a lot about death and in fact seneca goes so far as saying that death is the ultimate test of character how you actually approach death is the ultimate test of character now this is one where the worst case scenario one of these days is going to happen we're, we're all going to die um, and therefore the, the focus there shouldn't be on overcoming death because that's impossible I mean, again see above when we were discussing you know uh living life according to nature and understanding how the universe works well one thing that there is to understand about how the universe works is that we're all mortals we're gonna die so then the question isn't really death itself the question is how you can handle it how you are you prepared when it happens are you are your affairs in order are you mentally prepared are you emotionally prepared uh, I, did you prepare your relatives, your loved ones? You know, did you talk to them, and so on and so forth? Uh, those are the things that you can do. Those are the things under control, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You you can write your will. You can talk to your friends and family. Uh, you, you can prepare mentally. This is going to happen, and then when it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Now, after it happens, uh, the Stoics agree completely with the Epicureans. That's it. Done. There's nothing else to be to, 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 to do because there's not going to be any you anymore. So there's so being afraid of death, as in what happens after you die, it's like nah, there's nothing to be afraid of there because there isn't going to be any you anymore. Remember the Stoics were materialists. They thought that death is the end of the story. You get reabsorbed in the universe. Hmm. You re- become part of these of the uh, what they call the logos, the universal. This, this notion that we can essentially recycle uh, as part of the universe, but we are not going to exist as independent consciousness mm-hmm. uh, anymore. Mm-hmm. And therefore, there's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, as Epicurus, who is sometimes actually, despite the fact that he was a member of a rival school, he's often quoted by Seneca. As Epicurus said, you know, wherever death is, you are not. And wherever you are, she is not. Mm-hmm. It's, you're simply not going to be there. You're going to be there 
before it happens. But once it happens, that's it. There's not going to be any more use, so don't worry about it. In Seneca, in fact, in a very modern passage, at some point writes to his uh, friend Lucilius that, that um, you know, it's silly to be afraid of, of what happens after death. Those, those are the things that the poets are, have been scaring us with. Um, or the or the priests have been scaring us with in order to control us, but there's there's nothing to be afraid of because there's nothing. Period. There's there, there's going to be no sensations since there's going to be no body. There's going to be no sensation at all, and therefore there's nothing to. It be It won't matter of. to you. I mean, it, how would it you know if you don't have a body and you're not awake? You're right. not aware of anything. It's it's not going to matter to you at all. And right. if and if you do, then so be it. You know, you you decide what you want to do at that point. But if if there's Correct. nothing there anyway, it's it's not you're not going to have a space to react in. That's right. That's exactly exactly right. <laughs> so so Massimo, I you know we've been we've been going for a little while. We've covered a lot of stuff. I mean, is there a way we can wrap this? together with a nice little bow tie make it pretty <laughs> okay what do you have in mind well <laughs> i mean i i want i really wanted to to mention your book that you that you wrote a uh, handbook for new stoics it's it's actually yeah. on the screen for people to look at uh we will provide the amazon link when does this book come out the book comes out on uh, may 14th uh and so it's so just a couple of weeks away yeah I mean, I or less. I went I went through the book and it's actually really well written and really well Thank structured. You. Um, you tell us a little bit about it. You you there are weekly exercises that you sort of perform each week for with a different goal in mind. Correct. It's it's a total of fifty two exercises. Might even can go on for an entire year uh, doing this thing. Although my co-author Greg Lopez and I uh, actually provide a shortcut in the beginning and say, if, if you don't want to go through the whole thing, here's the most important exercise and then see how you feel um, about it and see if you want to proceed. But basically, the book is is written as a, a workbook, as, a, as if it were, in fact, a CBT, a cognitive behavioral therapy workbook. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to interact with it. You don't you don't just read it. Right. Uh, the, the, actually, the publisher, the experiment, did a very good job at from a graphic perspective to highlight the different parts of the book and leaving space for people to write down their notes and check in boxes and things like that. But essentially, every exercise, uh, every chapter is structured the same way. Uh, it starts out with a hypothetical day-to-day -day situation. So somebody who gets upset, for instance, uh, because she's gone to the gym and somebody else has been misplacing stuff and so now that gets in the way of her doing her routine, you know, something like that. Um, so it's a normal, it's a day-to-day -day situation, things that can happen to any, any one of us. Mm -hmm. Then the, immediately after that, we introduce a quote from one of the major Stoics, usually Epictetus, Seneca, or Marcus Aurelius, although there are some others that are quoted here and there. Mm -hmm. And the quote has direct pertinence, it's, it's directly relevant to the situation that, that started out the chapter. After the quote, we explain the theory, we say, okay, so here's why this particular quote is relevant to this particular kind of situation. Here's how it's supposed to work. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the chapter is an actual exercise where the reader is guided step by step throughout the week into actually practicing whatever it is that we that the exercise is about. So, for instance, if it is about not getting upset, uh, you're going to say, well, okay, here are some techniques for not getting angry. Here mm -hmm. are some techniques for overcoming the irritation um, and then people can write down every day how they're doing if they're, whether they're improving or not if what, whether the exercise is working or not for them then set it aside onto the second exercise hmm. okay yeah I mean I, I really love it because it puts into um, a frame that you know th th these concepts can be practical and you you really deliver that you really deliver a method to sort of learn the different because I feel sometimes the the Stoics were a, a little abstract. You know, it can be an abstraction to discuss emotions. Like, what is fear really? You know, like fear yeah. may mean something different for me than it it does to you. You know, we're clearly afraid of different things. So with this, you know, you're you're putting people into situations with their with their own lives, and it's you know it is set up like a a, a workbook. I'm just paging through the book right now, and you know it says. On week fourteen, you just you evaluate your goals, you know, and it's it's full yeah. of really practical stuff just like that. I mean, I'm I'm not only just pitching it because you're my guest. I'm also pitching it because <laughs> I really enjoyed it. 
Thank you. Yeah, I think it's it's unique. I mean, there are, there's a number of books there on stoicism. I, I wrote another one a few years ago called How to Be a Stoic. Um, but most of the stoic the, the books about modern stoicism that are out there are interesting. I mean, that you know, there's lots of good ones. Uh, they tend to be either theoretical or discursive. They talk about the history of stoicism. There, there's some reference to practice for sure, but not in a, such, a, such a systematic way, you know, hand, you know, holding your hand kind of way as uh, the, the, the um, handbook for new Stoics, which I co-wrote with uh, Greg Lopez. So I, I, we think that that's a unique entry into the canon, so to speak. So hopefully it will be uh, useful to people to actually put this stuff into practice because let's remember, remember, Stoicism is a practical philosophy. It's supposed to change your life. If it doesn't change, if Adipictetus, again, himself, warns some of his students, he says, you know, if you, if you came here just to learn theory, you're wasting your time. If you don't get out of this classroom and actually practice, actually become a better person, actually, in fact, implement these things, then you're just wasting your time. Then it becomes just an exercise, in turn, an academic exercise in the, in the bad sense of the word. And, uh, and stoicism is supposed to really change your life, and it does. I mean, there's lots of people that like that I started practicing uh, a few years ago, and they told me that you know this, this, this approach really has turned things around for them. In some cases, helping them out of really bad situations. In other cases, just generally making their lives better. Focused, uh, you pay more attention to what you're doing, you're less prone to anger, and and therefore, you know, people like you more, you're, you're, you're better at dealing with people and so on. Wouldn't it be amazing? It's like the social media version of like road rage would decrease massively. <laughs> Maybe all the haters we have would just chill out and relax and, you know, have a drink and sit back and, and not take everything so personally. And, right. you know, I just it I think it genuinely can help. I mean, that's why we covered this is because I, I really think stoicism can offer people even after so much time um, now, today, in the modern world where we are overrun with information, connection, and things that generally produce anxiety. Mental illness is something that people deal with. You know, I think one in four people in America are, suffer from some disability. So, you know, I, I, think, I think the mental frame that we have on things is so crucial, so important. Massimo, thank you so much for your time and energy and um, just the material. I, I love the way that you, you know, wrapped it all together. Uh, just, I know there's a lot of it, a lot of material, and a lot of these people's lives, like Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius, like they, they lived very intriguing lives. And so, so to, you know, kind of bring it back around for us studying them, I think, I think you did a great job. Well, thank you very much. This, this was a lot of fun. And, and hopefully it's going to be useful to your listeners. Yeah, yeah, I'm certain it will be. So just one more time. Um, the book is called A Handbook for New Stoics, How to Thrive in a World Out of Your Control. It's a 52 week-by-week -week lessons guide written by my guest, Massimo Pigliucci. Am I saying your last name right? The G is silent, so it's Pigliucci. Pigliucci. Okay, I'm sorry. I should have asked that. We were in a mess of organization at the beginning. And Gregory Lopez is the co-author. And, mm -hmm. and then when is the date? Uh, this is going to be available. Awesome. May fourteenth. It's, uh, it's available for pre-order now on Amazon and that on. Great. Uh, we will make that link available in this video, and I'll I'll send you a link uh, as soon as we wrap this up. I'll I'll send you a link where you can put it out to your feeds as well. Massimo, thank you so much for for being on the show as our first live format guest. Is really <laughs> truly an honor to speak to you, sir. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Guys, you heard here, that was our guest. I mean, wow, what an amazing show to come back on. And, you know, there's there's so much more in store and ahead. Uh, we've got a whole litany of guests that are just absolutely going to blow your mind. They are going to blow your mind. That That's how good it is. So be sure you stay in tune. I'm going to run the outro. I've been working nonstop for the last few weeks just I was in the jungle for a little while and now I'm, I'm back in the states and uh, we're going full steam ahead with everything that's happening at HXP so I hope you guys are ready for that um, here's the outro guys thank you so much and we will see you you will hear from us next week